you are faced with circumstances that you can't get through. Oh, and right now it seems that there's no way out and that you're going under. But God's proven time and time again, He will take care of further into the service obviously y'all know the month of October is pastor appreciation month and um, the Sunday school classes and really the, the church in general uh, has come together like we always do every year to give uh, brother Jason if you would come Miss Tiffany and Nolan if y'all would come the church has collectively gotten together um, baskets and gifts and all sorts of different things for this guy right here um, being our pastor and not only him but uh, Miss Tiffany and Nolan, and uh, again, we've all come together. We've got, uh, Nolan has got, what is it? Nolan has a black Nike book bag with socks, some gift cards, and a shirt. Yay. And then for Tiffany, we got you a basket. Um, it's got a blanket, some notebooks, a candle, you know, all the things that Tiff likes. And then, yay. And then for Pastor Jason, there is lots of things. Goodies, gift cards, socks, ties, cards, you name it, it's there. And the money tree. Money tree is for anybody who wants that dollar bill up there, all right? So you can come. I'm just kidding. But we, we want to say as Haynes Baptist Church, um, y'all don't see what I see a lot of the times um, that that 
that this family takes and gives. And um, this is just a something small. Um, I think what would mean more to Brother Jason, and I know Tiffany likes gifts and she's fine with that, but Brother Jason, he's, he's words of affirmation. And uh, what, what would mean more to him and, and the whole family in general, if you would just come by, it doesn't matter when or where. The month of October, you shouldn't just say, hey, I'm appreciative of you. Uh, I think it should be every, every, every opportunity you get to say hey to Brother Jason. That's just my opinion, though, all right? That's just my opinion. But Brother Jason, Miss Tiffany, Nolan, we, we thank you. Uh, we love you. We, it doesn't go unnoticed um, what y'all do and how much y'all sacrifice. And we just want to say from Haynes Baptist Church, we love y'all and we appreciate y'all. Y'all may be seated. We actually have just a couple of people that are going to come here and, and just testify, um, just just real brief um, about what this family means to them, but the church as well. So, um, if you three, the families would come on up. Okay. Okay. Brother Kevin has something special to present to Brother Jason, so they can go first. Uh, because your pastor, and now our pastor, because we got to join, uh, has been so obedient, and because Tiffany is consistent, uh, <clears throat> I can't do it. Okay. I'm going to go first. I just want to say, God's used you guys, and I've changed. I just want to say, I'm glad we're here. All right, so we've been here for a year, and um, as far as leadership goes, as far as how much I've grown, I've grown as a husband, I've grown as a father, and I've grown as a leader in my business. And, um, oh, don't want to hit that button. Um, and then that's just what I've learned from the church. Now, I can't say enough things about that because I know it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and one thing that I have learned is, I don't mean to say this out loud, but I don't come to church for him. I come to church for Jesus. So that's one thing that I've learned a lot. But if I am going to talk about him, I looked up um, 10 things that leadership uh, leaders should do, and it's got to be good because I Googled it. Um, one, uh, makes others feel safe to speak up. Two, makes good decisions. Uh, communicates expectations, does all these things. Communicates, challenges people to think. He's accountable, leads by example, measures and rewards performance, provides continuous feedback, properly allocates and deploys talents, and asks questions and seeks counsel. Now those are the top 10 things according to the Google. It's awesome. But that's not what I really learned from him. What I really learned from him was being biblical as a, as a man. And that's the, um, it's not, you can't put that on a list. So, and he asked for this. So, um, so you get this. So, uh, here we go. So, this is what he does when y'all aren't watching. He carries around extra weight. So um, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. All right, so I've been coming to the church for about two months and I've known Jason for about a year now. Um, I just want to say thank you to him and thank God for putting Jason in my life. Um, it's been an, am an amazing past two months since I've been saved. And Jason's helped hold me accountable. 
Um, he's loved me. He's been there for me unconditionally. I know he's there for me no matter what. In and outside of church, he's just been there for me, and I really appreciate that. And I know I can't do it without y'all, and I know I can't do it without his family, so I thank all of y'all, and I thank Tiffany and Nolan and just everyone in the church for accepting me and, and loving me. And um, I know we're competitive in the gym a lot, and we're always trying to beat each other, but it's not, life isn't just about trying to please others and trying to be the best person you can be, but it's about pleasing God. Um, it's about having God in your life and trying to live like Jesus, and I just, I want to thank y'all for teaching me and loving me, and I want to thank all of y'all uh, for, being, for, for being there for me, too, and it just, just accepting me. So, I just wanted to say thank y'all. Thank you. Sam, I know where you are. This, this is way out of my comfort zone. Uh, the song that was sung this morning through it all was very appropriate. Um, because through it all, God has Truly taught Jason to trust and love. Uh, uh, Jason, when you came into our home, uh, he was a wandering, broken, scared young boy with a big chip on your shoulder. He was trying to find your way and you wanted to fit in with everyone around you. You loved with all your heart and you were a happy-go-lucky. But you were always missing that one piece in life that made you complete. You got into church and you got involved with little skits and when it camp in the teen outings and in 1996 at the teen outing with Tommy Steele you made your first profession of faith to Christ I knew it then that God was going to truly step into your life and you were and going to use you in a very mighty way life changes and then those true teen years hit You were very ambitious and went your own way. And then you moved out on your own. And you definitely started straying away from God. God kept carrying you in his footsteps, never letting you go. You would call on late nights. And we would have long talks when your burdens were troubled and heavy. And I can remember telling you that God gives us trials with choices, and we have to make those choices. But God was going to use you. God had never gave up on you. And we'd always end our conversations with tears of love. And you, would, you and all of the children were always in mine and Uncle Jerry's prayers each night. On the night of September the 28th, 2003, I got another special call. You were excited. You had accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You had finally found God. You stepped clearly in God's footprints. 
but the tears of happiness and love fell through over the phone lines. And I looked up, thank God. I miss our late night phone calls with questions of why and not understanding of God's plans or ways. But instead today of having our phone conversations, now today, Uncle Jerry and I sit in God's church, opening God's word, as a very special young man brings the message that God has laid upon his heart. That special young man is you, Jason. Continue sharing God's word, loving and serving, serving God's people, and walking in God's footprints. We love you and are so proud of the young man that God has chosen you to be. And I love you too, Tiffany. I apologize, we're out of order. But, uh, you know, uh, when they asked us to give a, a testimony about how we appreciate our pastor, how much we appreciate him, you know, I started asking the Lord what, you know, what I could say, because um, there's nothing you can say or do that, that could show your true appreciation for our pastor. And, uh, but the, the Lord uh, led me to some scripture. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, the Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. One of the things I wrote down that I, I appreciate about our pastor is that how he pushes or fosters an atmosphere of growth. But he doesn't like for us to be complacent, to sit still. He challenges us to grow in the Lord. He urges us to study the scriptures for ourselves, not only take his word for it, but I trust that he's following God's will, but to study for ourselves so that we can grow in our own knowledge of the Word of God. And uh, I thank him for challenging me to step out of my comfort zone. Um, one thing that comes to mind is becoming the choir director. Never in, a, in my 32 years of life, I dreamed that God would have me up here uh, being the choir director. And um, I thank him for challenging me you know, even though the salary is not what he promised, but I'm not, I'm not bitter. No, I'm but, <laughs> but, uh, 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 seriously though, I thank him for speaking the truth in love and without compromise. I've never been around a leader like our pastor that has so much love in his heart for other people. And, and I believe that our church reflects our pastor. Everybody knows that we've been through some hard times here lately, but everyone's shown, shown us so much love and they have helped us so much in our time of need. And I believe it's because our pastor shows us love. He shows us the love of the Lord. And he preaches God's word in love without compromise. 
And we thank you for loving us and accepting us and not trying to change us. Thank you for letting God do the changing, letting his word do it. And uh, thank you for being my family's one and only pastor. We love you. We know a lot's been said, but again, like, I, like it's already been rehearsed over and over again, we thank you guys so much for everything. It doesn't go unnoticed, and we know we're on the other side of heaven. Y'all will see the rewards that y'all have done here, and uh, not only touched the lives of us, but many others. And, and again, we love you, and we appreciate y'all. sure everybody won't want to talk so I'll talk for everybody as they hide behind me but uh, very grateful uh, for all of you um, you know I, I feel like you, my aunt my uncle was a, a punch to the gut on that one right there <laughs> and uh, but you know they if it wasn't for those of you who understand a praying mama or a praying dad I can't tell you the times that, uh, that I know they prayed for me and and I was able to see God change them, and I appreciate that. And I want to say probably the greatest thing I ever seen in the Lord was not the Bible they taught or the Bible they preached or a Bible that a preacher preached. I can go back to my life, and I can remember when I was a kid, and I saw how the Lord changed my aunt and my uncle. And because I seen it in them is how God done it in me. And it reminds me all the time that you ain't got to know everything in the Bible, but if you'll live it and let the Bible change you, it does more for our children than anything else could ever do. And uh, not perfect by no means, and I'm far from it, but uh, they're home. I'm sure grateful for it. And of course, Brother Aaron, and I was getting right with the Lord. I think I told you $50,000 a year. Is that what I told you? Is that, that is the number, ain't it? 70? Was it 70? Now, I, I know it was like 50, 70, it was somewhere. But I was walking by faith, uh, you know. <laughs> so, I don't know. And then I was sitting there looking at that poor family with that new child. And I'm thinking, he could really use that $70,000 right now. And, uh, but I appreciate really Aaron. And, and uh, you know, partially that's not me. That's Tiff too, because when it comes to music, uh, you know, I sometimes I think I sing well and then she tells me the truth you know what I'm saying so anytime I ever do anything I usually acknowledge what she does and, and then of course uh, Brother Kevin and his wife Miss Renee uh, probably nothing more humbling to me and I, I don't think some of you understand the degree to that and also Alex and a lot of you understand the church setting but I still believe in reaching people outside the walls and I, I can't make no apology about that don't take this wrong, but you know as well as I do, sometimes church people are the most stubborn people. They don't ever want it. They don't, they don't care anymore. They just come in and do their own thing. So the way that I get fed is getting outside of these walls and, and being involved in the community. And that's a community I'm involved in. But listen, I sit there thinking, me and those two men right there, we, we have a Bible study every week. Amen. God does mo as much for me in that Bible study with two men they come outside, and listen, and he just got saved September the 5th, accepted Christ. Alex did. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. And, um, of course, uh, Kevin and his wife and him getting baptized with his, with his children. You know, don't, don't get me wrong, but anybody can pastor a church that God calls and puts his hand on. But if I'm not pastoring this church, I still have the same commandment that God's given you. And that's to reach people and be able to grow together as Christ. Amen. And that's what it's all about. And I feel like sometimes that's why we're losing everything in the church. Because we're so worried about this that we forget about the one-on-one. -on -one, reaching people, loving people, telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only telling it, but trying to live it. Can I get an amen right there? So I appreciate them. And I do thank God for that vest. And no, that's not a vest for you to shoot me. And that's not, everybody all right? So don't be getting your rounds out, okay? It's not a bulletproof vest. That's not what that's for. And uh, 
though I feel like sometimes I need it around here. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I'm, I'm grateful for all of you. And more so for my wife and my son. I, uh, without hesitation, I could tell you if I couldn't do it with them, I would not do it. Wouldn't even think twice. Three, four years ago, I'd say I'd fight it. But God's allowed me to reprioritize some things in my life. Him being number one, my family being number two, and ministry being number three. For a long time, he was number one, ministry was number two, and family was number three. And God had to break us. And uh, we, we made it. So by your help and your mercy and your grace, and I do mean that, and the Lord's and your prayers, we might not be perfect. Tiffany's close. We're all growing. And uh, I appreciate and I love you. And I thank you more so for doing something for my wife and my son. I know it's past their appreciation. But I'll be honest with you. If you do something for them, I'm happy. And I'm not just saying that. I know, I know a lot of y'all stand. Well, it's past their appreciation, not past their wife. I understand that. But if you're going to give me one month, 11 months, they're the ones carrying the load. It's really 12 months. So you loving on them, appreciating them, not Facebook stalking my wife and criticizing her behind your back. Hey, man, I'm going to preach it straight, friend. Loving my son. You know, he probably picks his nose the same way your son picks his nose. <laughs> now, listen, we're just a family, and, uh, and we're blessed and honored to do what we do. And it's by God's grace and His love and His mercy uh, we can. I'll finish on this note. My Aunt Billy bought him some shorts. I put them on last night. He said, Daddy, quit wearing my shorts. I said, I can finally fit in them. But most of the time, he's always wearing my socks, my T-shirts. My, I said, you know, can't keep clothes. But anyway, so we love you. Have I said enough? Yeah? What's that? You want me to say more? He's like, no. All right, I love y'all. Thank y'all. Y'all can be seated. Amen. You sing it? Huh? Yeah, same, oh yeah. When a man looks so tall, your faith is so small, your back's against a wall. God above who's looking down in love He's always been faithful and true and He is a friend who sticks closer than a brother and He knows your pain like no other so don't be afraid
nothing else matters Life just doesn't mean anything God's a present help in your time of trouble When everything around you has crumbled He will never change He will remain forever the same God's still faithful in the midst of it all Father, I love you, and I thank you, Lord, for this morning. And Lord, just from the beginning, Lord, even just now, Lord, the whole thought, the whole theme is, is your faithfulness. And Lord, we know that no matter what we face, that God, we can face it with you. And Father, we know that no matter what happens, we can face it as long as we face it with you. So Father, I pray that this morning, that God, that you just help us. Lord, there's many people that's here from different avenues and positions sin in their life Lord problems lack of faith fear God some people just struggling in their home and the marriage situations that have arose because of choices that we've made really I don't know Lord everything that everybody's going through but God I do know that you are the answer so Father I pray that as we open up your your word God that you would use it Lord, that we'd be able to apply this word to our specific life, no matter where we are as a husband, a father, a, a mother, a wife, a child, a, a Lord, a parent, whatever it be, a leader, just the child of God, a Christian, an individual. And Father, we would apply this to our life where we could walk out of here, and Father, we would understand what the Scripture says, so that God, that we could be changed. And Lord, I pray that we would allow that word, Lord, to be able to find a lodging place, so that when the time comes, and God, that the Spirit itself is trying to do something with inside of us. That God, it would be so powerful that our flesh would break. And God, we would allow ourselves and we would make up the choice to do as the Bible says. Not to walk after the flesh, but to walk after the Spirit. God, let us yield ourselves unto you. And God, in everything that we say and do, every choice that we make, everything that we ask, everything that we desire. God, I pray that we be yielded unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. But, Lord, let us either direct or redirect our focus to you. Lord, it's not about just what we've done. So thankful for what you've done so far and for me and my family. But, Lord, I, I pray that today the day would be about you. Because if not, that we're going to miss an opportunity for somebody to be drawn to the Lord. So help us and speak to us and speak through us. And, Lord, I'll be careful to thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will, this morning, open your Bibles up to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. 
And I know this is a very familiar portion of Scripture, and uh, this morning what I want to do for the sake of time is I really want to be able to give you the story, and I'm going to read a verse, if I could, that's found in verse number 18, I mean chapter number 18. The verse that I would read this morning will be found in verse number 29. And the Bible says this, And it came to pass that when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was, ne- there was neither voice nor any answer, nor any that regarded. Notice verse number 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And the people came near. If I could for just a few moments, I'm going to give you the story, but allow you to understand that that is the pivotal moment in this story that I'm telling you. See, in verse number 29, you see failure. In verse number 30, you see somebody taking responsibility. In verse 29, you see chaos, letdown, discouragement, disheartened if you could. In verse number 30, you see a man stand up and you'll learn soon by the power of God that's inside of him that he knew that he trusted the Lord. He made up his mind that no matter what everybody else's outcome may be, And everybody else's opinion may be, I know who my God is. And that's why Elijah said to everybody that was there, come near to me. See, in this text, you find out in the very beginning of it, if you can know the story, that literally that the children of Israel, that Israel as a nation is in a bad situation. The reason is is because for three and a half years there had been absolutely no rain and the problem that was going on was because literally they was trying to think about all the animals and the different things of such but there was no way to be able to take care of anything because there was no water to be found in this place. I would dare say it was a situation that they had to address. But see the problem was not just the people. And the problem was not the rain. When you study the Word of God, you find out that the problem is poor leadership when it comes to this nation. Though the nation of Israel was God's people, the people that were leading the nation of Israel, listen to me, was absolutely wicked and carnal. Now maybe this morning you could turn that around and you can make it to where it sits in your seat. Maybe I could dare say that the problem in some churches is the pastor And the problem with some homes is the daddy. And the problems with some of our people and our ministries is the leader. We always want to be able to outsource everything. When the truth be told, sometimes the reason things are not what they need to be is because there is poor leadership. These people love God. But in the midst of that, there was a problem. And the people that were supposed to be leading them to the Heavenly Father, known as Ahab and Jezebel, was not doing what God has asked them to do. The Bible says this, Proverbs 10, 7. It says that the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. You always wonder why you don't always hear about the people named Ahab and Jezebel. I'll tell you why. Because God is not going to give honor to somebody that lived so wickedly and so awful. There is no way. So there's a problem that's sitting at hand. Now the story goes that there's a man by the name of Obadiah that literally that he is sitting second in command to this man by the name of Ahab. Now, let me help you understand something. In verse number four, the Bible says, I'm sorry, in verse number three, the Bible says this about Ahab. And Ahab called, called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Listen to this. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. In verse number 12, I want you to listen to what the scripture says. And it came to pass that as soon as I am gone, that he uh, that as soon as I am gone away, away from thee, the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee, whether I know not. And so so when I come and tell Ahab, he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. So, in other words, what I'm trying to prove to you here is Obadiah was not somebody that was unfamiliar with the Lord. He was very close to the Lord. He walked with the Lord. But the problem was is the person ahead of him was crippling him. Now this is not my message this morning, but let me say this to you. Be careful who you follow. Be careful who you're walking behind. Be careful 
of what's actually going on in your life because just because you love the Lord today and you might show out like you love God all the time, the people that's around you, the people that's leading you, if they're not on God's side, it very well may cripple you in your life. As you continue to be able to read the story, you find out that literally that even though he knew God, that he was in a crisis situation, he was in a bad spot. And the situation that he was in was literally a situation that he realized that now that he was not doing the right, right thing for God, he was really doing the wrong thing. And here's why. Because I've learned, just as you have, that usually, listen, usually, it's when we are in a crisis that it actually reveals who we really are. It's that gut check situation that usually reveals who you are. It's that moment that is very tough, a moment that is very hard, a moment that begins to cripple you or buckle you or pressure you. And When you find yourself in that moment of your life, you'll realize real quick who you really are, not only you, but everybody else around you. They'll really see how much you love the God that you say you love so much, so be careful how you live. The Bible says that they part ways, and as they part ways, they begin to go out. Ahab and Obadiah, and on the way, literally, he crosses the path, as the Bible says, with a man by the name of Elijah. And Elijah comes here, and when he meets Elijah, listen to this, he meets Elijah, and we know that they think that Elijah's dead. Now, I've got to give you all of this because this is the backbone of where I'm trying to go. They think that Elijah is dead. What happens is, is Obadiah meets him. And when he comes and he meets him, he's, he's scared to death because he don't even really know. But then Elijah reveals himself and he knows them. And now he's thinking, oh my goodness, i, I got to go back and i got to tell Ahab. But right here I'm sitting with Elijah. But I'm sitting with Elijah and I know what God has done to Elijah. But yeah, i got to go back to Ahab. Can you see how Obadiah is now battling on the inside? And I'll tell you why. Because he's trying to figure out who he's going to really live for. You know what I've learned? And I've seen people learn the hard way as well. That every time you live a double standard life, you always have to live a life that's worried. Anytime you live one way, one place, and another way, another place, you have to be worried. And the reason is because you don't know which way to go and you don't know what to do, but yet he makes his mind up and he says, I can't go back simply because I know if I do that, Ahab will not only kill you, he's going to kill me. So because of that, he's now feeling pressure that's in his life. But as the story goes on, there's a man by the name of Elijah that he comes and he says, okay, he and Ahab, verse number 15 and 16, they begin to meet. They begin to be able to have this agreement. What they say is we're going to do this. We're going to go up the Mount Carmel. Both of us is going to sit down. We're going to lay down an altar. We're going to put down the stone. We're going to put down the wood. We're going to put down the sacrifice. And we're going to pray down fire. That's exactly what we're going to do. Both of them will make up their mind. They go up there. You can read the story. You find out that literally that when they begin to pray and they begin to do these things, that nothing ever happens. Why? Because they are, they are praying not to the true God but they are praying to a God named Baal and because of that there is failure there is a mishap there is issues that goes on and Elijah's standing back and this is what he's doing he's saying I knew you couldn't do it matter of fact the Bible even says he's mocking them but then the table turns because the Bible says in verse number 29 and 30 that Elijah said to them come near to me I want to bring this point out, thinking on this thought, if I could, when it's up to you. See, I don't know how many of you are maybe in a situation where it's like me. You ever come to a situation where it seems like there's no hope? You ever trying to be able to help somebody? You're trying to fix a home, fix a life, fix a marriage? You're trying to help somebody that has sank in sin so much that you yourself and everybody else think there's absolutely no way. They try counseling, they try medicines, they try, and I'm not knocking on that stuff, but they try all these different programs, they try taking them to church. Some of them don't even try to get baptized. Listen, none of those things ever change you like Jesus Christ will change you. And I believe as the Bible says that therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I believe when the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you ain't got to clean somebody up. If they walk with the Lord, God will clean them up. But the problem is, is so many times we get to that crisis, that moment, that situation. 
And it falls on us to where now everybody else has exhausted everything they know. But now it's up to you. Now it's up to you to really make a decision on what you're going to do. Now it's up to you to be able to actually yield to something. Now it's up to you to actually do what's right. And you're going to find out in this text exactly what Elijah did. He literally turned around and he began to pray out to a heavenly father. And he began to pray for God to be able to send a fire. And thank God he did because we know as the story goes, when all the other people fell and everybody else was let down and everybody else quit and everybody else turned back, that Elijah Elijah believed in the one true living God and he trusted in that living God and even though he didn't understand it he knew that God would be faithful and I want you to know today that there's going to be times that it's going to be up to you it's not going to be everybody else's choices it's going to be your choice and I'm not just talking about in your house I'm not just talking about in the church house I'm talking about all across this country we must make up our mind that I will believe God and I will trust his word and I will live what the Bible says. We're going to have to do the same thing that Elijah done, and that's trust the Lord with every single bit of our heart. The question is, do you today? If it depended all upon you, I don't care how young or old you are, are you close enough to God that you could pray through for your family? Are you close enough to God that God can allow something to begin inside of you and through you so others can be helped by you and by the Lord? Or do you have to outsource your prayer? Do you have to call somebody to pray for you? And I Listen, I'm not knocking somebody praying for you because I need people praying for me all the time. And all God's people said, Amen. But there comes a time when it says, no, I'm not calling on her. and I'm not calling on him. Hey, God's looking down from heaven, and he's trying to use you. And he's trying to use you and your life and your family. And he's wanting to touch your life. Could you get a hold of God if it depended upon you? What would happen? I want you to notice a few things in this text about what Elijah had done. When it was all up to him. Notice if you will verses number 29 and 30. Walk with me quickly. And it came to pass at midday. We've already been here. That they professed the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice. That there was neither voice nor any answer. He said nor that they regarded. Notice in verse number 30. He said Elijah said and all the people come near unto me. And all the people came near to him. Listen to this please. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. First thing I'd say to you today when it's all up to you is this. You're going to have to slow down and you're going to have to make up your mind that you're going to actually fix what's broken. You're going to have to fix what's broken in your life. You can't keep band-aiding everything. You can't keep brushing everything up under a rug and come to church and take a shower and put your smelly good on and act like you got fixed. You got to see sin for sin. You got to see the problem for the problem. You got to see the mountain for what it really is. And you got to make up your mind I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to face it. I'm going to let God speak to me and speak through me and fix the problem. Whatever's broken down, you got to make your mind up. I'm going to let the Lord fix this in my life. Everybody wants revival. Everybody wants to get something when they come to church. Hello, listen to me. Can I tell you something? Don't think for the first second that you and me is the first person that comes to church wanting something when we come to church. I can promise you when he went to the Lord that day, he wanted something too. Let me ask you something. How come he got what he needed, but we walk out of here sometimes saying we never got what we needed? i tell you why. Because we never slowed down and fixed what was broken. We come in here, we let them sing them good songs. I know that I can make it. And man, we're like, hallelujah, I know I can make it. Yeah, you can make it, but you got to clean out from what's up under the rug and you got to fix what's broken before God's ever going to do something in your life. I mean, we really, I say this all the time, we treat God literally like he's a genie in the bottle. We're just going to walk in and bam, everything's all right. Everything's wonderful. Everything's glorious. We're just going to go on out of sight, out of mind. They don't know about it. They don't know about it. Praise God. We're just going to move forward. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. The first thing that he done in his life when he needed something, that's the key. He needed something. Do you hear what I said? He needed something. He wasn't playing games. He wasn't coming to be seen that day. His heart was broken. It was overwhelmed. The challenge was far too great for him. 
And there was nothing he could do. This is a father that's trying to fix his family. This is a spouse that's trying to fix the marriage. This is a child that's trying to fix a home. This is a leader that's trying to fix a ministry. This is a pastor that's trying to lead a flock. You come to a place where it's not game time. It's serious. You need the Lord. And he stopped and he said, before I go any further, I got to repair what's broken. I got to repair what's been torn down. Let me ask you something. Has something been torn down in your life? Has the relationship with you and your heavenly father been torn down? I got all kinds of scripture I was going to read this morning, but there's all kinds of scripture that talks about the break of fellowship between you and God and me and God because of this sin that's in our life. But let me show you, share this one scripture to you. But do you know what the Bible says in Micah chapter number 17, ver, uh, chapter number 7, verse number 18? God delights in mercy. God delights in mercy. God delights in mercy. Listen, you might be living in sin. There might have been something you've done in your past that you haven't forgiven yourself for. You might have been a failure in your life. But do you know what the King James Bible says? God delights in mercy. God will forgive. God loves us. God cares. But there's a way to get what God wants to give you, and it comes by 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. You can't get, you can't get forgiveness until you get confession. So I want to ask you something today. Is there something that's in your life? And I'm not told it's got to be a big thing. Is there something that's in your life that has broken down that relationship with you and the Heavenly Father? You come to get fixed. Listen, you can't get fixed until you fix what's broken. And you've got to be able to identify it the way God sees it. When's the last time you heard the Lord? When's the last time you talked to the Lord? You know what I was convicted about this week? And I pray every day. I pray every, I mean, I'm, I'm not boasting. I mean, I'm telling you, I pray every day. Of all people, as a pastor of this church, I was convicted this week that I don't always pray as much as I should because sometimes I don't want to hear what God has to say. Can you imagine being Ananias and God telling you to go talk to Saul who's killing everybody? And you're thinking, Lord, I've been talking to you and you're going to tell me to do something like that that just don't make sense. Can I get a witness in here? Somebody help me preach this morning. It's not all about sin. Sometimes there's things in your life that God will ask of you that just don't make sense. And it seems so big, so, 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 so abundantly large that you just cannot overcome it. You say, God is too big for me. God is too overwhelming for me. And because of that, you find yourself where you don't talk to the Lord the way you should. Is there something wrong with you and the Lord? Maybe this way, is there something broken down between you and somebody else? Maybe you and the Lord's all right. You think you are, but maybe you and somebody else ain't. Something with a friend. Maybe something, is everything all right between you and your spouse? Everything all right between you and another leader? Everything all right between you and another Christian? Hard to believe two Christians can't get along. There's either, there's either, there's, there's something wrong in that statement. Either somebody ain't a Christian or something ain't really wrong. So you tell me what it really is, friend. I mean, that's Bible, unless you can deny it. I mean, that's the way, that's the way it is. Something, you and a spouse, you and a friend, you and a child, a child and a mom, a child and a dad, whatever it may be. Is everything all right between you and a leader, you and a hero? Is everything all right between you and your pastor and your pastor and you? Is everything all right? Because we want God to do something. Let me say this. If you're not asking God to do something big in your life, you're not as close to the Lord as you think you are. I'm going to tell you, there's some times where God will get you to your knees and you realize that the only way it's going to happen is not by getting to church and not by getting in the Word and not by getting by a good so soppy song that's going to make your emotions turn. Now you know that you've got to hear from heaven and God's going to have to shake you and break you and fix you and put you back together. You're in desperate need of the Lord. That's the only way some things come. And I promise you, when you get to the bottom, you'll begin to look around and say, God, put it out. I'll get it right. Put it out. I'll fix it. And on your knees, you'll crawl. And you'll say, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Yeah, but you never. Nah, just forgive me anyway. I feel like in my heart I've done something wrong. Or maybe I've done something that God didn't want me to do. You might not have ever seen it. But I know it because God grieved my spirit. Just make it right. You'll never get 
or you need to get when it's up to you if you don't fix what's broken. I could stop there and that be everything of the story and the message. And I believe every single one of us can identify what's broken in our life. The second thing that I would say to you, notice, if you will, chapter 18, verse 30 and 34. After you fix what's broken, you have to realize that only faith will reveal the answer. Notice in verse number 31 what the Bible says, And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of sons of Jacob, and to the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with these stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and make a trench out of the altar as great as it would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood on, put the wood in order, and he cut the bullock in pieces, and he laid him on the wood, and he said, listen to this, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. Now wait a minute, they're praying for something that they ain't even got right now. There's been a scarcity of water for three and a half years. Everybody listen to me. They're asking God to do something that don't even make sense to themselves. Are you understanding that? Number two, they're even doing it to make it things a little difficult. They're pouring the water on top of the sacrifice. I know you and I have heard that preached and taught a thousand times, and we probably read it. But I'm telling you, the odds are against Elijah. But you know what he's doing? He's getting it to a place to where he realizes there ain't no man that can do what God can. And he is living by faith. And I'm going to tell you something. There comes a time in your life and my life where we come to a crossroads where we realize the easy thing ain't getting out. The easy thing ain't quitting. Come on now, y'all help me preach this morning. The easy thing ain't turning back and throwing in the towel. No, I'm going to tell you the best thing to do for your life and my life is to be able to get to a place where we ask God to do things that can only be done by faith. And that's literally what he said. He said, I want you to be able to pour the wood. That didn't even make sense. Pour the water on the wood. That don't even make sense. And then notice what he says there. He said, I want you to fill four barrels. But I want you to notice this, if you will. The Bible says in the very next verse, and he told him, he said, and do it the second time, verse number 33. I mean, 34. Notice this. And he said, do it the third time. So look up here, friend. He ain't just filling four, four barrels. He's filling four barrels three times that's 12 barrels in all he has to fill. Now let me tell you why this seems to be so crazy and it's by faith. Number one, because there wasn't no such thing as water that was that supply that was around them. Number two, there's been men that said, well, they probably walked to the sea. Well, the last time I checked, they was in the evening sacrifice. If you study it out from where they were at Mount Carmel to get down to the sea, I don't know that they could have made that many trips down to the sea to get the water. Can I get an amen? Can I get an Amen. So there has to be something that just don't. So where did he get the water? You remember all those people that were spectators that came up to be able to see uh, Ahab pray? I believe they had water for their journey and they gave it up. You know what I've learned living by faith is giving up something you think that you need so God can get the glory. Giving up something you want. Giving up something that you feel like you need that makes your life so secure and your life so controlled. Hey, you're never going to get what God wants to give you when it's up to you unless you fix what's broken and you start making decisions based upon faith. Preach on, preacher, preach on. He said, I can't fix my marriage. Get on your knees. Yeah, I've been praying. You ain't been believing because if so, you wouldn't have said the statement you just said. Come on now, y'all help me preach. A lot of times we're asking God to do some things and we want God to do it, but we don't even believe it ourselves. Why? Because we're not living by faith. He wants everything. You know what he said? He said, do it the first time. Okay, that's not enough. We need to give more. Do it the second time. That's not enough. Do it, do it the third time. Can you imagine what that must have been like? You know why? Because there's a scripture in my Bible that says this, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. You know what living by faith means? Look up here, friend. Giving God everything. Giving God everything. 
everything that's in your life, from your home, your marriage, your, your financial things, hey, your, 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 your material things, whatever it may be, you've got to be willing to give God everything. Because when it falls on you, look up here. The Bible still says in Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6, but without faith, it's impossible. Do you hear me? I'm almost done. I'm not going to be long this morning. But without faith, it's impossible. But without faith, it's impossible. It didn't say that it might work and it might not work. No. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And so many times we think we're trying to do what God wants us to do, but we ain't living by faith. We ain't living by faith. We ain't trusting. We ain't trusting. Number three. Number three. Third thing I'd say to you would be this. You have to focus on what's beyond you. When it's up to you, you have to be able to focus to be able to look on what's beyond you. Brother Austin, if you would, you go ahead and come. Keep your Bibles open. I want to give you these last two points, but I want you to stay with me because I want to finish what the Lord's put on my heart. I want you to follow along with me if you could. The Bible says in verses number 17 and 18, notice this. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, and Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Listen to his response in verse number 18. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. In verse number 18, you know what Elijah was focused on? He was focused on Ahab. Why don't you go down a little bit further, verse number 21. Notice what the Bible says. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Do you know what Elijah was focused on? He was focused on the people. Come on now, listen to me. Don't lose me. Don't fall asleep and don't get distracted. Elijah's getting ready to have to do something that only God can do through him by his obedience. But when he starts off, he's focused on a man. Then he's focused on the people. And then if you go down a little bit further, notice what the Bible says in verse number 27. It says, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God. He is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or peradventure. He sleepeth and must be awakened. Now he's focused on the false prophet. Do you know why you and me, maybe I should change this. Do you know why I feel like you and I, I know why I do, sometimes have to wait so long for God to do what God wants to do in my life? Because I'm focused on everything else except for the one that I should be focused on. And here's the way I feel. God, I've, I've tried to fix what's broken. God, I've addressed the things that nobody wants to talk about in my life. God, I've I've trusted you by faith. I mean, Lord, I'm addressing that. I'm moving forward. I'm I'm doing this and this and this and this and this. And I get right there. Man, I'm looking at everything. And I wonder why in the world are things just not falling in place. And then God reminds me that I'm trying to rationalize everything. Trying to make sense of it. I'm almost trying to build some kind of letter to state, Lord, this is why you owe me when I think you owe me. Y'all be quiet, but I'm telling you straight. A lot of times we think, Lord, I mean, that's not me, that's her, that's him, that's not me, that's them, that's not me, that's that. He goes even further. I want you to notice what the Bible says. Then he gets down to verse number 36, 37. Notice if you will. He says this. He says, It came to pass on the offering the sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God. You know what happened? He took his eyes off of the man. He took his eyes off of the people. He took his eyes off of the leadership. And he turned his eyes on the Lord. And he said, God, I don't want to prove them right, and I don't want to prove them wrong. God, my only desire is that people will see that you are the one true living God. 
Do you know why a lot of us starchy, good, sanctified, justified, righteous living Christians, I'm being funny right there, you don't have to laugh. Those of us that have it together sometimes don't always get used as much as we think we should be used because we're right in everything except for the reason why we're doing what we're doing. We're right because it's standard. We're right because it's law. We're right because it's the right thing to do. When the truth be told, the only way to be right is not for you to be right, for them to be wrong. It's for God to get the glory. You know what this church don't need? A battle between deacons and a pastor and people and everybody having different accusations. And then all of a sudden, when something works up, us stand up and say, well, I told you I was right and you're wrong. There's no unity in that, friend. What we need is everybody to be able to have the mind of Christ. What's the mind of Christ? The Bible says that He did not come to be ministered, but to minister to. In other words, He didn't come that that He might be able to be seen. He came to be able to minister to other people. Hey, the, the heart of Christ is to see people get saved. That's the heart of Christ. We don't preach unity and integrity and excellence and obedience in the house of God and our communication so we can look good. We do it for the cause of Christ. We want sinners to get saved. We want people to know that they can come with broken lives and in time and in the grace of God that God can fix them and clean them up and set them and change them for eternity. Amen and amen and amen. My last point that I'd say to you is you have to follow with boldness. The Bible says in verse number 38, listen. He said, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Listen, he just followed the Lord with great boldness. See, it's one thing for you and I to hear everything God says. It's a whole nother story to actually do what God says. It's one thing for us to come in on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night and pray around the altar and say that was a sweet time. It's another thing when the preachers are gone and the singers are gone that you and I still get on our face before God and we carry out what God told us to do last week. Are you hearing me? we got to make up our mind, I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 1, the Bible says, The wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You know how you get boldness? You do what God tells you to do. You do what God tells you to do. And when an enemy looks at your, in your eye, and by the way, sometimes your enemy might be dressed like you. Sometimes your enemy, and I hate to say this, could be dre- dressed like you and go to church with you. They shouldn't be your enemy. But don't think for the first second that the devil wouldn't like to use somebody to come up against you in the cause of Christ. Amen. Maybe this morning there ain't but about three or four people that actually want to be used of God. But I promise you this, when it's all up to you, and there's going to come a time it's going to be up to you. I don't care if you're a teen boy. I don't care if you're a teenager. I don't care if you just got saved. There's going to come a time where a family, a wife, a husband, a ministry, somebody's going to look to you. And I want to ask you a question. When it's all up to you, will God be able to trust you? Oh, that's the preacher. He'll fix it. No, friend. That's up to them. They'll fix it when it's all up to you. When it's all up to you. Somebody somebody said, well, you fix a marriage, you know, it's 50-50. No, it ain't, friend. It's 100-100. Because I can promise you, you can give your 100, but he or she, they got to give their 100 too. And if everybody ain't giving 100%, God can't do what God wants to do. But you know what? We can't ever fix anything because we're scared to death to fix what's broken. Walk by faith. Sit down and look here. Focus on the right thing. I know some. How many of you? How many of you? How many of you ever been hunting? Anybody ever been hunting? All right, good. How many of you like deer meat? How many of you like deer and don't think we ought to shoot deer? It's okay. Be honest. All right, it's good. Okay, good. It's fine. No big deal. You ain't got to worry about me because I don't ever have time no more. It'll be fine. <laughs> you ever try to get a Zoom 
and have that scope and get out there and you're wanting to shoot a deer. We're talking about two, three hundred feet away. What happens is, is you can't really get in because you've got your focus so broad that you can't actually see what you're trying to shoot. You're so worried about what's in the big picture that you can't even look in and zero in on what you're supposed to see. That's what a lot of us problems are as, as, as us as Christians. We're, we're so busy looking at the big picture trying to figure everything out instead of looking at what God wants us to look at. And if we would set our eyes on Him, I believe without a doubt God would fix everything else. So I want to ask you again, if it all falls on you, if the reason you're dealing with whatever you've been dealing with or you're dealing with this morning, if it all falls on you, do you have enough courage to fix what's broken? Are you man enough, woman enough, Christian enough to accept responsibility, get along with God, walk by faith, focus on the Lord, quit blaming everybody else for your problems and your failures and your issues and your children and your marriage and your home and your ministry? And say, Lord, I tell you what, if it's up to me, I'll be found faithful. Our Father, I love you and I thank you for your word. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. But the great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you are lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you would, you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.